Hello all and welcome to the Lucretia Report. I'm Ian and today, how our own minds can be turned against us. Support this channel by subscribing, giving the video a like, and leaving a comment, and consider supporting the channel at Patreon.com. In 1989, a small, thin-haired, 37-year-old officer at the Soviet KGB was stationed at a KGB field office in Dresden, East Germany. The Berlin Wall had just come down, and the communist government in East Germany was quickly collapsing. In Dresden, a crowd of people marched towards this field office, incensed and demanding their departure. As the crowd approached, the officer emerged on the gate and warned them that his men were armed and they were willing to shoot if they came any closer. This got them to withdraw for a little while, but he knew that this would only be temporary, so he began burning documents and lobbying his superiors for support. Stationed in the area, prepared to fight if a war broke out, but also there for moments like this, was a Red Army tank brigade. He appealed to them for their support, but the answer they gave back to him shocked him. We can do nothing without Moscow, they said. And Moscow is silent. It wouldn't be much longer before the Soviet Union would fall apart, and after the collapse of the USSR, this officer would retire from intelligence work and go into politics, eventually becoming only the second president of the Russian Federation, a country which he has now led for 21 years. I'm of course talking about Vladimir Putin, and what happened that night in Dresden is a key part to understanding the way that he thinks. That night in Dresden made Putin realize how easily established elites and political structures, which seem so strong, so impervious to change, can be overturned by masses of ordinary people. And some people may look at that and take the lesson that, oh, this means that the people deserve to govern themselves, but not for Vladimir Putin. For him, this was a lesson that the people's minds need to be controlled in order to safeguard his political order. For several years, the Russian intelligence services have been doing just that through information warfare with remarkable success. I think that there's two things we need to understand first of all about how Russia thinks about these operations and how their mindset differs from our own. First of all, to the Russian security apparatus, this is not a weapon of war used only in times of conflict. A lot of people reasonably have the idea that if you're not at war with a country, you shouldn't attack them, but not Vladimir Putin and not the GRU and not the FSB. To them, the Cold War never really ended and they have to fight a constant and unending struggle to defend their interests and defeat their enemies. The second thing is how we think of cyber warfare. As a lot of countries, including the United States, have invested more in their cyber warfare capabilities, we've tended to think of cyber warfare and misinformation as separate things. Cyber warfare we think is things like hacking into electrical grids, and misinformation is usually just something that individuals or groups of individuals do and not necessarily something that the state does. But that's not how the Russians think either. To them, those are just two sides of the same coins, and misinformation is a weapon just as valuable and just as applicable to states as any other. With these mindsets, they've taken to conducting information campaigns against not just the United States, but countries all over the world, and it's a much bigger problem than I think a lot of people realize. Definitely the most famous instance of this is what they did in the 2016 U.S. presidential election. In 2016, Russia went through great effort to aid the election of Donald Trump. They of course went through some of the traditional cyber warfare techniques, like for instance they hacked into the Democratic National Convention and leaked a trove of emails to WikiLeaks, and the Republican-controlled Senate Intelligence Committee has concluded that they tried to attack election systems in all 50 states. There are several ways that they determine this, by the way. For instance, they can compare styles and digital fingerprints to other known Russian hacks, and they observed things like that the hackers only seemed to work when it was daytime in Moscow, and they took off Russian holidays. The most effective thing, though, wasn't these traditional cyber attacks, but the disinformation campaign that they ran on social media. There were reportedly thousands of GRU agents, each controlling potentially dozens or hundreds of social media accounts plus thousands more automated accounts, 
all pushing out not only pro-Russian information, but also disinformation about elections. Fake news about each candidate, conspiracy theories about a Hillary Clinton kill list and Pizzagate, even inaccurate dates for elections and things like registration deadlines were all pushed out mostly on Facebook and Twitter with the help of paid advertising on those platforms and hundreds of thousands of useful idiots in America who made these things be seen by millions of people specifically targeting swing districts and counties in battleground states, especially Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. It's not clear how much impact this had on the election. Maybe Donald Trump would have won without it, maybe he wouldn't have. But it is clear that Russia was trying to help Donald Trump get elected, probably less because they thought any specific policies would help them, although I'm sure they loved his views on NATO, and more because they thought that he would cause chaos, distrust, and polarization. And well, if that's what they thought, then they were correct. Really quick plug before we keep going, if you want to contribute to counteracting Russian disinformation on Facebook, go like our channel's page for videos, news, articles, and more. Link in the description. Moving on. Something that makes all this even more dangerous, though, is how Donald Trump and his administration have reacted to all of this. Apparently fearing that accepting the intelligence community's findings would delegitimize his election, he's taken to not only claiming that he didn't collude with Russia, but that the whole idea of Russian interference is a hoax perpetrated by the Democrats and the deep state. Most famously, when he met with Vladimir Putin in Helsinki, Finland, he took Putin's word over that of his own intelligence community. My people came to me, Dan Coates came to me and some others, they said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this. I don't see any reason why it would be. I will tell you that President Putin was extremely strong and powerful in his denial today. This is dangerous not only because it has led to Republicans under Trump's leadership not doing anything to protect us from future interference in our elections, but because Russia's information warfare goes much deeper than just interfering in our elections. Russia has been pushing, using similar tactics, a number of pro-Russian narratives. Sometimes it's about false flag operations, whenever Russia or Russian-aligned factions get caught doing something unsavory they'll often try to say that it actually wasn't them, it was someone else doing it, but trying to make it look like it was Russia. When the Russian-backed regime in Syria used chemical weapons in Duma, for instance, or when a former Russian agent and his daughter were killed in England by poison, or when Russian-aligned rebels in Ukraine shot down an airliner, in all of these cases, they tried to push out conspiracy theories using the same kind of disinformation networks trying to say that these were false flag operations designed to make Russia look bad. They blame the British for them a lot. I don't know, maybe blaming America is too cliched. They know that in Western democracies where public opinion can influence government policy, that operations like these can undermine the government's willingness to respond or to impose consequences on Russia or Russian-backed regimes like those in Syria and the Donbas. In order to manipulate public opinion for similar goals, they also push out narratives supporting the Russian separatists in Ukraine and trying to undermine confidence in NATO, a military alliance that exists explicitly to oppose Russia. The RAND Corporation, for instance, in a report about Russian misinformation campaigns, compiled a list of tweets from Russian-backed accounts that were supporting the Ukrainian separatists in Europe and America. Ukrainian chasteners shelled 485 times at DNR during the day. Hashtag Novorossiya. DNR is the Donetsk People's Republic, LNR the Luhansk People's Republic, their puppet states set up in Ukraine by the separatists. USA started creeping intervention in Odessa. A thousand American troops are marching in the city of Russian naval glory. Shame! With three exclamation marks. The most prominent Russophobes and critics of the Russian government are on USA payroll. Everybody knows that. Russian expert. Instead of membership in NATO and EU, Ukrainians will get status of plantation slaves. Poroshenko proposes to the West to do ethnic cleansing of DNR slash LNR following the example of Serbian Krajina. Hashtag Ukraine. Hashtag Novorossiya. 
They've also been pushing conspiracy theories recently that try to link coronavirus to NATO, saying that the coronavirus was first spread by NATO exercises, that it was created by NATO as a bioweapon, and that NATO is not helping member countries recover from the coronavirus. You can see then how widespread Russian misinformation is and how they use useful idiots in the West to spread this misinformation and undermine us to their benefit. The scariest part, though, is how not just are we not doing anything about it, but taking their lead from the White House, there's now like a solid 30% of Americans who don't need much convincing. They're totally primed to believe that anything Russia does is good, and anything bad people say about Russia is just fake news possibly some in the comments section of this video. I'm sure Putin loves that. So what can you do to help? Well first you can help counteract misinformation by liking and sharing credible news sources in your own social media. Like for instance this video about how Russia is manipulating social media. Just saying. But what we really need is the government to step up. So what you really need to do is call your legislators and tell them that you want them to pass legislation to help protect our elections and to fight disinformation on social media. Because democracy relies on us being able to have a discourse where we all have the same basic facts and realities. And that just doesn't work if we have alternative facts. Seek Semper Tyrannus. Hey guys, I hope that you enjoyed that. If you did, please be sure to give it a like and leave a comment down below. You can watch another video here, and please consider subscribing here. Also, please consider supporting the channel at patreon.com slash Report. Thanks, I'll see you next week.